Hello. I wanted to give you some tips and suggestions for assignment two. Uh, I will say this is one of the more challenging assignments we'll have this semester. So before you get started on assignment two, I, I do want you to spend some time making sure you're really comfortable with metering on manual mode, right? Not really paying attention to the aperture and shutter specifically, but that you're comfortable adjusting the apertures and shutter to give you a good exposure overall. Um, it's really only once you're comfortable metering on manual that it'll be easier to do this assignment. So um, the principle or analogy that helped me kind of learn these techniques when I was getting started is to think of light as water in this one. So if you need to fill up a gallon of water, right, um, there's two elements here, right? One is how wide open the aperture is right? How, how wide open the faucet is, how much water is coming out. The other is the time that it's on. So at the end of either of these, you always get a gallon of water. But depending on how wide that aperture is, if, you know, the water is coming out very quickly, if it's coming a lot of water at, at that time, then you can fill up that gallon of water a lot more quickly than you would otherwise. So there's, if it's a wider aperture, more volume is coming out. If you close your aperture down to a small setting, only a trickle of water is coming out. You need a much longer time to fill up that same gallon of water. So these are still equivalent exposures. The exact same amount of light is coming out in each case. It's just about this combination of aperture and shutter, right? How wide, how much information is coming in and the duration of time that information is coming in. And depending on these settings, they're going to look a little bit different. The exposures will be the same, but the, but the visual effects will be different. So smaller apertures are going to give you a more broad depth of field. More is going to be in focus from near to far. Wide apertures, if you're close to your focus subject, are going to give you a shallow depth of field. The backgrounds will look blurry. So this assignment is really about not only understanding the exposure generally and how to you know, use exposure on manual, but also how to really control aperture and shutter for the effects that you want. So remember the metering techniques covered in the previous lectures. Uh, in, in general, it's, you know, bright or dark backgrounds that are probably going to be throwing off your exposure and making it over or underexposed. So as long as you're metering off of a mid-tone subject, so in other words, a mid-tone subject is filling your frame when you're trying to figure out the exposure. You're going to have a good exposure overall. So generally what happens is if you are photographing, say, a person um, in front of a sunset, right? You either have this problem where if you're metering the whole scene, the sunset looks fine, but your person in the foreground is really underexposed or a silhouette. If you want the person to be correctly exposed, you have to meter close. Get close to them so they're mostly filling the frame, you're excluding the sky behind them, and then your metering is based off them and their skin tone. Um, that's usually going to be a better option for you. For landscapes, it's usually the bright sky that is throwing off your exposure. So if you tilt the camera down so that most of the sky is excluded, you'll have a better exposure for the more mid-toned landscape. Exposing for shadows, uh, especially if you're photographing in a bright area, you're at the beach, you're in the desert, you're in the snow, somewhere where things are mostly brighter than mid-toned, um, it's better to expose for shadows. The shadows are going to be closer to mid-toned than the rest of the scene. So that will generally give you a better exposure overall. Meeting off your palm, it's kind of a last resort. It's kind of awkward to do. You have to basically put your palm in front of your lens, uh, making sure it's not excluding the light um, or you know blocking the light, and meter off of your palm. Regardless of skin tones, human palms are around mid-toned, 18% gray. So that will usually give you an okay exposure. Oops. Um, so in, in general, when you're metering, again, just make sure that you're tilting your, um, sorry, uh, just make sure that you are tapping your shutter, right? That's what's going to engage your light meter. When you're looking through your lens, tap your shutter. What you'll see is this little bar right here. This little bar is your light meter. And as long as it's right in the center right here, you're going to have a pretty good exposure. As long as what you're pointed at is a relatively something close to mid-toned subject or object. 
if it's up here on this side, this a little plus right here, um, this means overexposure or positive exposure. So you're going to have increase of exposure if it's on this side, which means overexposed to bright images. If it's on this negative side, right, if it's on this side of the dial, um, that's underexposure. Not enough light is coming into your camera. So if it's down here, you're going to need to increase your exposure, either by opening your aperture to a wider setting or by lengthening your shutter speed to a longer time. So in general for metering, just make sure you're practicing those techniques. Make sure you're mostly metering off mid-toned subjects using the techniques we just discussed. And make sure your light meter is going to be kind of right in the middle of this dial. Um, that's how you're going to make sure that you have a good exposure overall. Uh, another thing to think about is ISO. So you generally don't want to increase your ISO above 400 because you're going to get increased levels of image noise. The higher that ISO number is, the more noise you're going to see in your photograph. And noise is ugly, right? It's going to degrade the photograph appearance. Um, in, in film, it's a little bit different. So high ISO films are actually, you know, silver granules that's built into the film. And the grain can be an interesting effect. It can look, you know, it can look interesting depending on the technique you're trying to use. But no one really likes the appearance of image noise in digital, right? It's just not attractive. So in general, you want to avoid this whenever possible. There are ways of getting rid of it or reducing it in post process, but in, in general, as long as you can use a tripod or something to stabilize your camera so you don't have to increase your ISO, you're going to have much better results. So whenever possible, either use a tripod or if you don't have a tripod handy, you can stabilize your camera on a steady surface. Just be careful when you're doing that. If you press the shutter button, sometimes it can jiggle the camera a little bit. So if you aren't on a tripod, it's usually a better idea to use a camera remote or to use your camera self timer. Um, a camera remote is a pretty good thing to pick up if you don't already have one. One might have already come with your camera. Um, and it's just a way to activate your shutter without pressing the shutter button, which, you know, pressing the shutter button, if you're not on a stable tripod, um, it can create a little bit of camera shake. So this is a nice way of avoiding that. So what is your assignment for assignment two? Um, the depth of field and motion assignment. So for part one, what you're trying to come up with is identical compositions. There's not going to be anything different between the two shots. The only thing you're changing here is your aperture and shutter settings, right? So the creative use of depth of field reveals something in one photograph that is not evident in the other. In other words, in one photograph, the background will be blurred and you can't make out the subject in the background. And in the other one, the background will be sharp. In both photographs, the foreground subject will be sharp and in focus. Right, this difference should not be subtle. You have to use both a very large and a very small aperture. I suggest using your, your widest aperture setting and your smallest aperture setting. Keep all other elements the same. The same ISO, the same framing, the same, ex the, the same you know, exposure um, equivalent, the same distance, same POV. Make sure you set your lens to 50 millimeters. Um, this is also important. Uh, wide angle lenses, as we discussed in the previous lecture, um, give the appearance of a broad depth of field. So if your lens is set to 18 millimeters, it won't really matter what aperture and, and you know, shutter combination you're using, you're going to have a pretty broad depth of field no matter what you do. So make sure you set your lens to 50 millimeters. So focus your lens on the same foreground subject for each image. This is very important. So you're allowing depth of field just to shrink and expand around your focus subject. Your focus subject has to be the same. So make sure you don't change your focus as you're changing your aperture and shutter. So you're probably going to create or choose a lot of different settings and angles for each pair of images. It will likely take you several attempts to get the results you want. So experiment. Um, you can reveal any background subject you want, so be creative. Um, so again, depth of field, f22 is a very small opening with a very broad depth of field. F2 is a very large opening with a very shallow or narrow depth of field. You'll need to use both a very small and a very large aperture opening to get this result, right? To get a big change in depth of field between the two images. You can try using your camera's depth of field preview button if you have one. It's not necessary. You can always, you know, look at the images afterwards and see if you've achieved a depth of field difference. Perspective. The closer you are to the object you're focused on in the foreground, the more shallow depth of field becomes. Now remember, your camera is always showing you your widest aperture 
at all times. Even if you have your camera set to f22, you're not really seeing what f22 looks like when you're looking through the lens. You're only seeing your widest aperture. So whatever setting you have as your aperture, what you're seeing looking through your view is going to be your camera's, that lens's widest aperture setting. So again, just kind of keep that in mind. Most people have this thing where they kind of forget that, even if we've talked about it a few times, it's hard to remember that when you're looking through your lens because you want to trust that what you see is what you're going to get. But again, this is one instance where that's not the case. So if you have your camera set to f22 and you're looking through it and the background still looks blurry, just know that when you press your shutter button, your camera is going to close down to f22, to that aperture, and that's when the shallow depth of field will be created. Right? Your camera thinks you need as much light as possible to view your scene and to compose your shot. So it's always showing you your aperture fully dilated. So as much light as possible is coming in. So if you're always seeing your camera's widest aperture effect and the background doesn't look blurry to you and you focused on your foreground subject, that means your perspective is off. That means you need to move closer to your foreground subject and to make sure the background is sufficiently far enough away that there is space for it to become out of focus. So remember the three factors that impact depth of field, aperture, the size of your aperture opening in your lens, right? Wide apertures create a shallow depth of field. Small apertures like f16, f22 create a broad depth of field. Um, the area around the, the focus subject is going to stretch and expand and look to be sharp and crisp and in focus. The, the lens focal length is a second thing impacting depth of field. Now we're going to take this out of the equation by just having that focal length be set to 50. So what you're really focusing on is aperture and distance, just to kind of simplify that so you get comfortable with those effects. So distance from the focus subject is the third thing that's going to impact depth of field. The closer you are to your focus subject, the farther the background is, the more depth of field shrinks around your focus subject. The farther you move away from your focus subject, the more things are going to be in focus behind that subject. It's going to stretch and expand in the background. So just make sure you move close enough that a shallow depth of field is achieved. And remember, you do have this depth of field preview button on a lot of camera models, not on all. Um, a depth of field preview button, it's usually kind of below the lens right here, a little button you press in uh, or a button, you know, like this. So generally, if you do have this button, you want to press it in while you're viewing your scene. You will notice the scene looks darker. Don't worry about that. That's not your exposure. It's just closing your aperture down to whatever you've pre-selected so you can see what depth of field actually looks like at that scene. Again, ignore how darker light it is and just look at the focus from near to far.